you know, I'm sort of struck. I, I think sometimes the, um, the best big ideas are the ones that after you hear them, you think, oh yeah, duh, that is exactly the way you should be thinking about it. And I, I, would, I would put this conversation into that category, <laughs> that something at, that everyone has taken for the duh category. Um, but, 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 I, but I do think it's the case that sometimes uh, the, most, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest ideas are the most obvious ones. So um, you, um, it'll be interesting to hear this panel talk about it a little bit. We're lucky to have Libby Nelson of the new Vox here, um, formerly of Politico. Um, I think all of us are carefully following Vox and your success and um, with avid excitement. Um, Amy Leighton from our own staff. Um, this is her idea um, and um, one that she talks about a lot. She's, she's a lively speaker and we're also very lucky to have, um, I'll pronounce it wrong, Kath Rail, Kazin and Hal Plotkin. I'm gonna let Libby do all of the formal introductions but it's, it's a great, um, great panel ahead of you. So enjoy. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> So before we get started, um, as she said, I'm the education reporter for Vox.com. We're a month old and it's been a lot of fun. So if, if you are reading and, and supporting us and watching our success, I am grateful for that. If you're not, I hope you will. Um, next to me is Hal Plotkin, a senior policy advisor at the education department. Uh, next to Hal is Amy, the deputy director for higher education policy at New America and a former policy advisor at the White House and at the education department. And at the end, we have Kate Gazin of College for America, a new competency-based education model at Southern New Hampshire University, which is a private university in New Hampshire. Before we get started talking about measuring learning and not time, I want to talk a little bit briefly about who college students are today, because I think that's something that a lot of people misunderstand and that's crucial to this conversation and to so many of the conversations I'm covering and I'm having around higher education. Most of the people here um, and most of the people paying attention to this conversation probably went to college right out of high school. You probably went to a four-year college and you probably earned your degree there. People who do that are less than 30% of the college student population in the United States right now. And people who are doing that at the selective or highly selective colleges that we spend a lot of time reading about and talking about are an even smaller proportion than that. So there's this growing conversation and growing debate about how we serve the other 71% of these so-called non-traditional college students who are a growing majority, um, both on campus, online, anywhere else you're delivering higher education. At the same time, there are questions about the affordability of a college degree for everybody, not just for non-traditional students. Um, and the value that you're getting for your money is as you're taking on student debt and as you're going to college. And what we're going to be talking about is one model that's been proposed as a solution to both of those issues, not just for non-traditional students, um, but for everyone else as well. So I want Amy to get us started. Um, we're talking about measuring learning and not time, but I think it might be news to people that right now we measure time. <laughs> so what, what is the system and how did it come about? Uh, thanks. So, um, so I want to talk about the duh idea, uh, <laughs> which I'm now going to call this. So the big idea, this big idea starts with something very small. It starts with the credit hour. And I'm assuming most people in this room have experience with credit hours. You might have paid for some. You might be paying for some now if you have students in college. Um, you probably took some. You know how it works. You go to class. You amass a certain amount. You, sort of, you pass go. Normally, if you have 120 credits, you get your degree and, and you move on. Um, so we're all pretty familiar with that. What you may not be familiar with is the history of the credit hour and also the fact that this seemingly innocuous, benign little unit is actually responsible for or has at least enabled some of the real quality problems that we have in higher education. So with that, we need to go back to the, the beginning of uh, the credit hour when it was born. Uh, back to the days of Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnate and philanthropist. So at the time, um, in the late 1800s, he was a trustee at Cornell University, and he was sort of distraught because he saw all of these faculty members, these professors who didn't make enough money to save for retirement, so they were working well past their prime, well past the time that was good for them or their students. I mean, some of them literally dying at their podiums. He thought, this is no way to, you know, to run things. So he did what <coughs> any of us would do when confronted with a policy problem. He took 10 million of his own dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and he created a free pension fund for uh, professors. And he set up the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching specifically to administer that. I had no idea it was set up to be a pension uh, facilitator. So 
he did that, and the, uh, the foundation basically needed a way to figure out who was going to be in and out of the pension system. And so they decided that only full-time faculty would qualify for the pensions. And full-time was, they decided it was uh, faculty members who taught at least 12 credit units uh, a semester. And so that was faculty who had 12 contact hours with students per week. So it was really designed to figure out who was going to get the free money. It wasn't designed for anything else. But we very quickly used it for a variety of things, I mean, including you know, class scheduling. Now we use it for compliance. We use it for financial aid. We use it for a variety of things it was never intended to be used for. And the real problem is that it became a sort of de facto proxy of learning. And it's a measure of learning. And the Kearney Foundation early on said, no, 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 no. This is not about learning, people. This is about time, faculty student time. Uh, this isn't about results attained. Please don't use it for, uh, for learning. But we couldn't help ourselves because it's easy to measure, it's easy to understand, it's easy to count. And so we took this sort of seemingly standardized unit and made it the bedrock of higher education. And I say seemingly standardized because when we think about it as a unit of learning, it is not at all standardized. If it were standardized, we would be able to take credits earned at one college and transfer them to another college, right? That one equals another. But it doesn't work that way. Colleges routinely reject credits from other colleges, they sometimes reject their own credits. I mean, Harvard itself won't accept its own summer school courses for credit. So it's, you know, and while this, you know, it's sort of funny and it's, you know, it might sound silly, it's actually a huge problem because about 60% of today's college students attend more than one college. So these are students who've sat in seats, who've paid tuition, who ostensibly have learned things and they have this little unit that's supposed to be transferable and they can't cash them in. They're not, they, they aren't a standardized unit of currency. So it's a real problem, and it, it sort of begs this question, if colleges are rejecting these credits, and if higher education doesn't trust its own credits, why should we trust them? And then, I'm the bearer of bad news for a little while, but it, it, will, it will become more positive in a minute. <laughs> but the truth is we probably shouldn't be trusting these credits. Uh, there's more and more evidence that today's uh, college students aren't getting good educations. There are, um, I mean, really shocking findings about college, uh, college outcomes that I know those of you who are currently paying for college, whether or not you're paying for your loans or your uh, students, your kids who are in college, it's a little disheartening. But uh, the recent government study found that 70% of college graduates, people who have a degree, couldn't do things like compare opposing uh, editorials. Um, and there's study after study that are showing these real big gaps in, um, in abilities. Now this might be surprising to us. Um, it's not surprising to business. Only 11% of business leaders think that college graduates are well prepared to succeed on the job. Um, and uh, this is this is a real issue because it's, we're, we're thinking about the global economy and we're thinking about these critical thinking skills um, and the skills that higher education says that it's best at, right? So employers are saying, not that students are coming to them with, without the specific technical skills, although that may be true, but they're saying they're not coming with the very skills that higher education prides itself on, critical thinking, writing, reasoning, problem solving, communication skills. So we have, we have some real issues. So we have an educational credit crisis. We have uh, students who have credits who can't use them in other places. We have students who have earned credits who haven't learned very much. And then on the other side, uh, we have people who have learned a lot and uh, they have a lot of knowledge, uh, but they don't have any credits for it because they might have learned it in the wrong place. Let's say they learned it on an online, a free online course, a MOOC, or they learned it on the job, um, but their learning doesn't count. And as we're thinking about a global economy and how important learning is, we can't afford for this to be the case anymore. Um, so what I'm excited about is that this is changing. It's starting to change. And Kate is going to talk about College for America and one model of measuring learning rather than time. Um, but this one model, there, there are many, or many potential models. Um, but these models are going to remain one-offs unless federal policy changes. And that's what Hal is going to talk a little bit about. Because uh, right now, the uh, federal government spends about $150 billion a year on financial aid to help students go to college. But they pay for time. They pay for credit hours. So, But there's good news. There's some um, exciting stuff that's, that's afoot. And um, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at. We're trying to get this big idea by getting rid of this small but somewhat pernicious little thing called the credit hour. So. 
So Kate, um, I want you to talk a little bit, to start off, Amy teed this up so well, that I feel like I don't have anything else to say, but um, talk a little bit about measuring learning or in the, in the more sort of quantifiable concrete term that we use because learning is a very amorphous thing to measure, measuring competency. Sure, so you know, there's a saying that if you're measuring seat time rather than learning, you're measuring the wrong end of the student. Um, <laughs> and I think there's a certain way in which that, that's true because um, we continue to talk about time sort of relentlessly. And the thing about time is that um, if you have that as the measure, it's the thing you're holding standard, but you're not actually, you're letting learning be sort of undefined and sort of squishy, right? So competency-based education tries to reverse that. So it says we are gonna be very specific about what we expect to see, what we want our graduates to know and be able to do, but the time is really irrelevant. Uh, so, so one of the cornerstones of competency-based education is that it is essentially time agnostic. Um, it could be self-paced, it could be self-paced within a six-month term, um, but it's not what the focus is. Um, I would say the second focus, which is really closely related to the question of making time flexible, is that what matters is mastery sort of rather than grades. And by mastery, I mean you have a certain bar which you've defined clearly, and students can take numerous attempts to make numerous attempts to get there, but you don't have people sliding through with a C minus as you can in a school or two, I've heard. <laughs> so that notion of mastery, um, as opposed to um, grades, of course, requires a third thing, which is really defining clearly what those expectations of students are. So at College for America, which as Libby said, is a private, not-for-profit school, uh, which is located in New Hampshire, but our school is actually online, so um, it could in fact be located anywhere. Um, we've tried to tackle some of those other problems, which I think in some ways are related to the credit hour. Um, we're radically affordable in the sense that um, it costs $2,500 a year, all inclusive. And when you think about that, that means that you could get a BA, for instance, for $10,000, um, which is a little bit startling, right? Um, and one of the things we're doing to address some of the other issues that, that were mentioned is that we're working closely with employers. So in fact, to be a student at College for America, you need to come in through an employer or through a community group that you're affiliated with. And part of what this does is it means we don't spend a lot of money on marketing but it also means there are natural cohorts that it makes it easier for our students to make connections between the workplace and what they're doing in school. It also means that we have connections to our partners in a way that we wouldn't if the partners were simply you know, writing uh, checks for tuition reimbursement. So our partners are range from you know, big corporations like ConAgra and Dunkin' Donuts. We, we're, we're pretty strong in the fast, feel, fast food, processed foods um, department, but to counter that, we also have strong healthcare <laughs> partnerships <laughs> with uh, Partners Healthcare in, in Boston, with Penn Medicine in Philadelphia and, and others. And what we're trying to do is answer those questions that um, Amy mentioned that every employer has. If you're an employer and you've ever tried to make sense of a transcript, you know that it doesn't tell you very much about learning, right? Somebody might have a B plus in sociology, which tells you maybe that they did better than somebody who got a B in that same section at that same school at that same time, but it tells you nothing about what they know and can do. So the third premise of College for America is that we care about evidence. So our students actually don't take classes um, they don't sit for exams, they do projects. And the projects are kind of real world, authentic types of experiences that enable them to demonstrate exactly what they know and can do. And this combination of project work, uh, competency-based education, relationship with employers, and then the ability to provide true access to our students is really powerful. Right? And these are students who uh, Secretary Clinton talked about today. Um, they're single mothers, they're you know, they work the second shift at ConAgra, um, that particular plant. Our first graduate actually um, was um, somebody who worked in sanitation at a Slim Jim factory in um, Troy, Ohio, uh, somebody who never thought he could go to college, who managed to finish this program in like 100 days or something. 
So some people hear that and say, wow, that's awesome. Some people hear that and flip out. Um, and so I just want to take one second to talk about the other piece, which is, although we're very focused on labor market information, very clued into our partners, this is a real honest to goodness liberal arts education. Our students uh, do projects involving art, involving environmental science, involving literature. And some of those actually sort of gen ed-ish kinds of things are among the most powerful experiences for our students, many of whom have never been anywhere near an art museum um, or you know, uh, thought about literature. Um, it makes it accessible to them in a way that they really didn't think was possible. So I would say um, in many ways our students are demonstrating those key cross-cutting foundational skills like critical thinking, like digital fluency, uh, like communication, like uh, so quantitative reasoning, but they're also experiencing um, content knowledge in a, in a number of fields. And um, I think that the results are not only as good as many traditional schools, but we actually have the evidence to help uh, guide that discussion. And that I think in the end is, is one of the most um, powerful things about our model. So you, you get, you've gotten a lot of attention, um, certainly in the higher education press, which is a small but uh, very closely, a small group that's very closely watching these kinds of experiments, but also from the think tank world, um, foundations, the kind President of people Obama. who are looking at this, President Obama, people who are looking at this. But it's partly because you, there are so few people doing what you do right now and so few institutions who are able to pull this off. And I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more now with Hal about what the education department is doing or can do um, to, to take this model to a broader scale and what sorts of uh, questions and concerns you're addressing along the way. Thanks so much. Um, uh, and let me take a step back to sort of uh, uh, put in context why this is, why this duh idea um, uh, uh, is so important to so many people, uh, including President Obama, who's talked a lot about how important it is, to, to use his words, to shake up the American system of higher education. He said that again just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it ties in with um, one of President Obama's other main concerns, which uh, he's been talking about a lot um, throughout his entire career, uh, which is uh, 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 in income inequality and the growing uh, uh, gap uh, between the rich and poor in our country and the social instability that that creates, indeed the path that it puts us on to eventual social collapse uh, if we don't figure out uh, how to uh, restore a vibrant middle class in this country and how ed education and higher education in particular can be an engine of that. And we have to confront the stark reality that um, during this period of decades when income inequality and social inequality was growing was accompanied by a massive investment in the higher education system, which many scholars, uh, uh, Sarah Goldrick Robb, uh, uh, Linda Har da Darling Hammond, um, many others have uh, done a very good job of tracing how our investments in higher education all too often have uh, ended up exacerbating the very income inequalities. They become engines of inequality uh, rather than uh, the engines of, uh, of equalizing opportunity that is in all of their marketing materials. So, um, uh, the, um, and I can tell you, I used to be, uh, in a previous life, I used to be president of the board of trustees of a public college system, and so I used to hire college presidents. And college president candidates would come in to talk with us that you know they wanted the job, and and I could do I, and I could predict it. I, I was I would joke with my fellow trustees, that how long will it take before one of the candidates talks about how their number one goal is to preserve the great traditions of our university? <laughs> um, nobody came into the job uh, interview saying I'm here to shake things up. Everybody came in promising that they were going to do a better job of keeping things exactly the way they are uh, than the next person. Um, and, so, uh, and so we have uh, uh, a gap. Uh, Mr. Wu was here talking today earlier about um, stagnant industries. And uh, it would be hard to find one that uh, a more compelling case for one than higher education. And the, proof, and the proof is in the results, in the social and economic inequality um, that pervades our society today and that threatens to continue accelerating away from us. 
So um, uh, in that respect, that's why we owe such a great debt. And one of the real reasons I wanted to be here today was to sit next to Amy Leighton. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, Who because, doesn't? <laughs> um, because Amy used to be right down the hall from me in the Department of Education. And, when, and a great colleague in, in fighting for the kinds of reforms that we need and the kinds of things that President Obama has been talking about in which he left the department. I said, Amy, please, you know, why are you, why are you leaving? And she convinced me that uh, she might be able to have more impact on the outside side that she was able to have on the inside. And a year and a half later, she certainly demonstrated that um, by raising the uh, public understanding of the fact that the very currency that we use to measure progress in higher education is itself uh, part of the problem. And it's uh, part of the problem for all of the reasons that, that uh, Amy indicated. So competency, the move toward competency-based education is part of President Obama and Secretary Duncan's uh, effort to shake up higher education by creating more transparency. And some of the efforts to achieve more transparency are better known. For example, um, uh, the, the attempts to make sure that students have a better understanding of what the graduation rate is at the college they're considering attending, or what the average debt level is, or what the average income uh, might be. Things that you would want to know to make an informed uh, choice. Because um, while no one has been a more effective champion of higher education than uh, President Obama and and the First Lady, Michelle Obama, who have talked uh, with great passion about the difference that a quality higher education made in their lives and encouraging uh, students to seek out a high quality education that meets their needs. Um, for, for, for too many other students, uh, higher education is kind of like that moment in the horror film when the audience realizes that the security guard is actually the villain and that the person or force that they thought was going to save them is actually the one that's gonna, gonna do them in. And, uh, and to protect students from those experiences requires a lot more uh, information. Um, a critical, uh, more atomistic part of that information is in this movement towards competency-based education, which gets into a deeper level of transparency than just what are you going to earn, are you going to be able to pay your debts back, are you going to have a reasonable chance of graduating, but instead, what are they teaching and, and what are they learning? Amy made uh, the wonderful point that um, colleges don't trust their own credits. They don't trust the currency between the institutions. And one of the main reasons for that is because they don't trust their assessments. They don't trust their tests. We're not going to give you credit for Math 10 because we don't trust the tests that that professor used in that college. We test for a different thing here. Of course, we're not going to show you the test because that would, and so everything's behind a black box. And, and uh, none of the um, learning outcomes are transparent. And so there is no uh, fluidity between the system and, and very little effective competition. Imagine a world, uh, for those of you for whom this may be a new concept, um, let me cut to the chase and then I'll be quiet because I'm more interested in hearing uh, others talk. But um, uh, imagine a world, uh, everybody knows what a flight simulator is, right? In the military, in the Navy, they would never take a new pilot and give her a bubble test and then say, okay, you scored an 87, here's the plane. You know, they put her in a flight simulator and, uh, and, they, and they put her through all kinds of different scenarios. One, one wing is on fire, the weather's bad, the engine's not working, the instruments are giving the wrong readings, all these kinds of things. And if she can land the plane eight or 10 times in those circles, then they give her the keys to the $300 million airplane. Um, well, where is the flight simulator for organic chemistry? Where is the flight simulator for physics, um, uh, for biology? Um, it's very easy to imagine and envision how these kinds of open assessments could be created that would generate uh, dynamic random scenarios that would be transparent in the skills or aptitudes that they assess and that would be a real world marker for what a student knew or could do. And if we had a few of those out in the uh, in the in cyberspace in the in the in the world of students and learning and work. Um, that were regarded as being widely valid and reliable, a reliable test. If you go through this simulator four times, it means you know organic chemistry. Then colleges could begin to compete with each other based on how well and how inexpensively they prepare students to pass those open assessments. We would move past this black box where I'm going to hide the P and you're going to, excuse me, professor. Is, is that going to be on the test? Do I, do I need to write that down? Uh, who's ever taught a class that hasn't heard that? 
Um, but if instead we had open competency-based assessments, we could really change the ecosystem in higher education so that there was more of the transparency that President Obama has been calling for. So toward that end, and to cut to the chase, what Amy was referring to, is just this past week, Secretary Duncan announced uh, what we're calling the first in the world competition which is a $75 million competition that specifically references in its preference uh, competency-based education and the need to develop new uh, tools that will enable and support it, um, that targets competency-based education at uh, STEM disciplines and at underrepresented students at an increasing time to completion. And one of the things that excites me most about it Decreasing yes. time to completion. A decrease in time to completion, <laughs> excuse me. And, and uh, one of the things that's most exciting from my perspective is there's also a requirement that all of the new intellectual property produced with these first in the world grants be released with an open intellectual property license that allows for the free use and continuous improvement of whatever those grants produce uh, by others, as long as they attribute the original creator. So uh, what we've done in the Department of Education is, is, is we've noticed this problem publicly. We talk about it a lot, and we're trying to the best of our ability uh, to bring resources uh, to the community so that uh, uh, leaders like uh, Southern New Hampshire and uh, others that are moving into this space can get some of the financial resources that they need to re-engineer the higher education system so that it can be begin to live up to its promise of being um, an engine of equality uh, rather than um, uh, uh, stuck in a, a mode where it arguably contributes to the inequalities that trouble so many of us. So I, ha I have this question written in my notes as, this doesn't sound like college. Um, but I, I was talking about it with some colleagues before I headed over here, and I kind of came up with a, a better way to phrase it, which is, I think people don't necessarily understand um, what the online learning environment looks like now and what it looks like for the vast majority of students. And so the idea of this self-paced or accelerated, um, you know, you take the test and you prove what you know, or you, you prove you can do it through a project and you move along is just kind of mind-blowing to a lot of people who don't follow higher education. So I'm hoping you can sort of explain how this does fit into the landscape of higher education as it already exists um, in America today and where it, where it is and isn't a radical change from what is already being done. So I would say that if you focus on the outcomes of higher education, which I would argue most schools are not doing a very good job of achieving, um, that our outcomes are actually the same or in some ways better. I think the outcomes are more pertinent, but they also include all the, the favorite stuff. What we don't have is the, you know, the, the half-remembered discussion under the leafy trees where you sat with your professor and three other people. Um, as you know, I think you made a good point of, of explaining, Libby, that is really a fantasy about what college is for the vast majority of people in this country. And so whether you were one of 500 in a lecture hall at Michigan State or whether you're, um, you know, you're, you're trying to squeeze in college between you know, picking up your kid at daycare and you know, trying to eat a sandwich at the same time you drive home to you know, pick up the other kid um, or make dinner or whatever it is, um, that's really the reality of the majority of, of people who are going to school. They're not in residential campuses, right? So, so I think before we say this is college or isn't college, I think we have to go back to that first question about, well, what really is college? Um, I think the residential campus, which I was privileged to go to, um, uh, I think serves as my president, Paul LeBlanc, would say, you know, the, the coming of age job. You know, it keeps kids safe and, you know, and energized and in between beer, you know, helps them explore what they want to do. And, you know, and if you had that experience, if you were lucky enough to have that experience, you know, in addition to the loans, you probably have fond memories. Um, <laughs> but, you know, higher education is also about credentials. It also has a relationship to, um, you know, to employment. And, you know, many of the working adults whom we serve are, you know, it's not just theoretical. I mean, they definitely want their minds expanded, but they also want opportunities. They want promotions. Um, sometimes they want to have a paycheck that's a little bit uh, heftier. Um, and that is what college is about for them. So I would kind of rephrase the question a little bit. Um, I'm, as I said, our, our students are reading, they're exploring, they're writing their heads off, um, but they understand why they're doing what they're doing. And to Hal's point about transparency and assessment, 
every one of our projects has a rubric, um, an evaluation guide, that tells students exactly what um, the people who review and evaluate their work are going to be looking for. That's not telling them what's going to be on the test. It's being transparent about what the expectations are. And as a kind of recovering academic who I guess has lapsed, um, <laughs> you know, I, I look back in horror at the days when I sort of, I knew what I wanted, but I wasn't going to tell you. I mean, it seems kind of insane now. Um, and, you know, it was incredibly subjective. And, you know, I, of course, gravitated to the students who were most like me. You know, well, that doesn't work very well. It doesn't work in employment, and I don't think it works in higher education. So um, I think transparency and evidence really need to be the watchwords, no matter what model we're talking about. Just about the online piece. I mean, I think, you know, online education is here, and uh, I'm not remembering the statistics right now, but many, many, if not the majority of students have taken at least one online course. I mean, it's, and it's not the, the, In type the 60s, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. So it's not just that you're taking a class, you're taking everything fully online, or you're on the quad, and you're in the leafy campus, and you're in that wonderfully Socratic, you know, uh, seminar with three people. I mean, it, it's not either or, there's a lot of uh, sort of combination. And adult students in particular have flocked to online just because of the flexibility that it provides. But I think if we're talking about like your question about where is it today, it it's an important question, but I think it's where can it go? So online education, there, I mean, there have been some advances and it's not just sort of one way delivering of knowledge, um, you know, there's more interactivity, but I think there's a greater potential for even more. I mean, I think this is where some of the adaptive learning technologies come into play that are really exciting and competency-based. So for those who aren't all in the weeds uh, like, uh, like some of us are, so Carnegie Mellon, uh, has a program that it's had now for how long? 10 years now? Yeah, about. about 10 years called the Open Learning Initiative in which a group of cognitive scientists and academics came together and basically said, okay, how is it that people learn? Like, how, how do they learn? And so the cognitive scientists said, here's how they learn. And then the academics said, here's what we want them to learn. And they sort of worked together to figure out what it is they wanted students to learn. And so students can work on, um, in, this, in this, uh, like com this computer program essentially that uh, and they could do it with faculty also, but they could also just do it with the computer where the, the um, assessment sort of figures out what it is that you know, so it doesn't spend any time then teaching you what you already know, and then it spends time teaching you sort of what you know. And through this program, it, um, it is able to figure out not only what you don't know, but how you learn. And the reason that it's able to do that is because there are now hundreds of thousands of students who've taken these courses. And so it's able to start to understand, oh, here's how this person learns. Here's the little hint they need in order to get to the next level. So you're able to have much more personalized learning at scale, and the results are better than in traditional classrooms. So organic chemistry, for example, students who took this, uh, this approach learned as much or more than students in the traditional, like in-person, face-to-face courses in uh, half the time or less. So, and we know at the end of it that students have learned something. And so you can see, I mean, in, in places around the country where they're not as fortunate as Massachusetts to have uh, a university on every corner and where it's really hard for them to get organic chemistry you know, professors in Montana, you can sort of see that this would be very attractive to getting students the education that they need and high quality education that they need. It doesn't mean that, that the technology is gonna be everything and professors are gonna go you know, by the wayside. I mean, Bryn Mawr actually has been using this as has Wesleyan and they've been using it basically to sort of say, you know, the faculty are saying, look, we have to spend the, a whole semester teaching this course and getting the basics out of the way, and it takes a full semester. But if we incorporate this into our classrooms, we can spend seven weeks doing that, and the next seven weeks we can do hands-on projects and really giving students the experiences that they're actually paying for and that they're thinking about when they're thinking about this liberal education model. So I think that there's a lot that is coming. I think, um, you know, I think it, I think we've come a long way and we have a long way to go, but I think both of those things are very, they're very clear what the outcomes are and students can demonstrate them. And we're, we're not clear about that right now in traditional higher education. We're like, all right, we know you have credits. Good luck, goodbye. So. Um, the, let, me, let me talk a little bit about the American opportunity in online learning. Um, uh, approximately 95% of the world's population right now, 95%, has no real access to high quality post-secondary studies of any kind. Um, only you geographic access, or how are you defining access um, in that context? In, in terms of the ability for them to benefit 
from available uh, academic resources that they can practically use. So uh, they don't have access, and, and when they do have access, what they have access to is a very poor quality. Um, you could quibble a little bit, is it 92%, is it 96%, about 6% of the world's population has some kind of post-secondary credential of varying levels of quality. Um, most of the rest of everybody else are locked out from those opportunities. Um, that 90 more percent of the world's population is where the riches of our generation reside. Um, it's the key to restoring economic growth in this country and around the world to levels closer to what they were in the post-World War II Goldilocks period when uh, um, a constantly expanding economy created opportunities that were more widespread. Um, but how are we going to bring post-secondary opportunities to the, to the world? Um, my friend, uh, Sir John Daniel, because of the demographic bulge in particular, around the world there are now hundreds of millions of young people who are uh, moving through the uh, uh, primary and secondary systems and who are going to be pressed with their noses up to the glass of the post-secondary system with no place to go. My uh, friend John Daniel, at the, Sir John Daniel at the Commonwealth of Learning, has calculated that to, to meet the known need for post-secondary studies in uh, 2025, we would have to build a new bricks and mortar college or university that serves 30,000 students every week for the next five years. Nice. Um, I don't know about you, but I didn't build a 30,000 person campus last week. And I'm unlikely to build one next week. So the only way that we're going to be able to begin to satisfy uh, some of those educational needs is by the advanced use of technology. And the technology that we have uh, in our hands today is the internet and online learning. Our initial research shows that online learning is typically most effective when it's used in a hybrid setting, um, uh, but that there are some uh, proof points that we've seen where online learning is superior and can be superior, particularly uh, with certain groups of learners um, in uh, economically important uh, areas of education, including, for example, learning how to build a wireless application that you can market globally, uh, or learning um, uh, Drupal or Ruby on Rails programming or things like that that are in high demand. Some of those things can be done arguably more effectively online right now. So um, uh, we're at the beginning stages still. You know, the internet is, is not all that old. I'm only 56, and I can remember when it was a, a fantasy. Uh, um, and hardly a day goes by when you don't see some kind of gee whiz, my goodness, look what they're doing now. So I think what our goal is in the, in the federal government and the Obama administration is to try and encourage uh, evidence-based innovation in online learning um, and to make the fruits of those innovations, uh, the intellectual property, widely available for uh, reuse, uh, including by for-profit uh, entities and companies that may see a way to take those um, advances and turn them into products that they could sell and markets that they could develop um, and, to, and to try and um, expand the promise of online learning without trying to sugarcoat it. Uh, it's certainly no panacea, but it's, you know, it's where the internal combustion engine was around 1904. And uh, you know, um, hopefully it, this will be less damaging to the atmosphere um, uh, than that was. But in terms of its arc of development, it's, it's you know, still in the crib. Since you mentioned uh, the, the analogy to the internal combustion engine, we only have about 10 minutes, so I, I want to keep this as brief as I can so we have time to take at least one question um, from the audience. What do you see as the obstacles um, that need to be overcome or the, the potential pitfalls ahead in the future for a competency-based model? Well, I would say, you know, the federal government has been... Um, enormously helpful in some respects and enormously supportive, but bureaucracies contain you know, vast storehouses of bureaucracy within them. And um, although I personally have had great experiences with the people who do federal uh, financial aid policy and we were fortunate enough to be the first college um, or, or university to receive um, the opportunity to give federal financial aid under the, what's called the direct assessment provision, um, the reality is that that provision, which seems on the one hand to, uh, you know, make it possible to give financial aid on the basis of directly assessing what students are doing as opposed to how much time they're spending in class, actually then makes you convert um, that very, you know, direct assessment into credit hours, uh, to go back to Amy's point. So, you know, I think that we need, um, you know, I think that we need to have a much more 
uh, robust uh, discussion about the role of financial aid in funding um, education, the role of the federal government, and also there are wonderful things called experimental sites, for instance, and I'm, I'm hopeful that 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 will enable some innovation to flourish. But you know, right now we're really in a kind of stuck place in which you know some people are getting to move forward, others aren't for reasons that aren't completely clear. And you know, we've been very fortunate, but my hope is that competency-based education will be enabled more generally and not just be you know sort of one school or two schools or three schools. Let's well, so just to piggyback a little bit, and for those who aren't as in you know in the higher ed policy world as as we are. I mean, I think folks think of higher education as largely not being related to the federal government because the federal government has nothing to do with, you know, it just doesn't set standards. I mean, it has really, in some ways, has nothing to do with higher education except for funding it. So it has everything, so it has everything to do with it. So it has absolutely everything to do with it. I mean, again, $150 billion a year goes towards uh, Pell Grants and loans, which students then bring to colleges, and, you know, so the colleges can do their thing. If federal financial aid dried up tomorrow, almost every single college would close its doors immediately. Maybe Harvard with its endowment could you know, survive, or well, yeah, they could. But for the most part, uh, federal financial aid is what, uh, is what drives and enables colleges to be able to sort of stay open. So the fact that for so long the federal government has been saying, we're going to pay for credit hours rather than uh, learning has been really problematic. And there's, there's a whole bunch of you know, sort of back and forth about you know, the regulations and what they mean and, and all of this and all of that. But the reason that it's become so complicated for the federal government is the reason that it's ultimately complicated for us and why we end up using the credit hour. It's because measuring time is easy and measuring learning isn't. <laughs> and so when you're talking about a big federal bureaucracy and just and stewards of federal resources, where as a federal government, you can't really be very nuanced. You sort of have to you know, you have to be clear yeah. or not clear, you're going to get sued. It's really sort of tricky to figure out how is it that we would measure learning? And does that mean big, bad national standards? Does it mean a no child left behind for higher education? No, no, it, it doesn't. Just so you know, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> but, um, but I think that, that there's really some discomfort with trying to figure out how we are how we're going to assess this, like who determines what the competencies are, how do we know that they're valid, how do we make sure that we're not just recreating the same system where, I mean, right now, faculty members, I mean, an extreme version of faculty could say right now, oh, we already have competency-based education. I'm a faculty member. I, I determine what the competencies are, and I create assessments, and I grade against those assessments, and it's working out just fine, but it, it's not working out fine as we have talked about earlier. So I think, I think there's a few things. I think federal policy needs to become more comfortable with the fact that this is an unknown space and we need to innovate and we need to have some experimentation, um, which is exactly what, as Kate said, there's these things called experimental sites that now the federal government is going to allow uh, some of this $150 billion, just a little bit, to go towards trying to figure out how to measure learning. So we're not, we're not ready, even though I like to say, let's just throw out the credit out. We're not ready to throw it out yet, but at least we know that we need to throw it out and we need to experiment responsibly to try to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I think, I think Amy, uh, you both put it uh, uh, brilliantly. The, 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 from the speaking on behalf of the bureaucracy, um, <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> I'm also a recovering I'm bureaucrat. I'm the most so. unlikely bureaucrat you're likely to meet. So I, it's a strange thing that I'm in that position. But um, uh, the, the challenge is to move from one slippery rock to another slippery rock in the middle of a rushing stream. Um, and, and, not, uh, and, and to really pay careful attention to the law of unintended consequences. Um, that in, the, that in, a, um, in haste to uh, improve a system that bar badly needs reform, we don't inadvertently um, create uh, more opportunities for unscrupulous oppor opportunists to uh, victimize um, uh, naive students. And, and so, you know, that's a very uh, fine line and a very difficult uh, path to walk. Um, one of our great opportunities, though, as a country, is going to come in the rewriting of the Higher Education uh, Opportunity uh, Authorization Act, uh, HEOA. And, um, uh, and I'm hoping that uh, the folks here at New America and at other think tanks around the country have um, teams of people working <laughs> on uh, drafting uh, what that <laughs> bill ought to look like. And I can think of a couple of people that one I'm sitting right next to who would be very capable of leading such a team. Um, uh, but we need to redefine the federal government's role in supporting higher education. There's actually a legislative opportunity coming up to do that. Uh, circumstances have changed. It's bizarre. Many of the things that we are 
um, governed by in the Department of Education related to online learning have their roots in correspondence schools and in the rules and regulations that were set up to govern correspondence schools. You remember the, the back of the matchbook that some of us grew up with and all of that? And so um, there's a great opportunity to modernize these uh, rules and regulations and to envision the protections for students uh, and the consumer protections that would be valid. Um, uh, but it's going to be a challenge to forge a bipartisan consensus on that. And I think we need to start exchanging some documents across the tables uh, as, as quickly as possible in public uh, to begin to form the bipartisan consensus that's needed uh, to get us to the place that I think uh, people of goodwill on both sides of the political divide agree on, which is that um, preserving and protecting the freedom to learn is the best possible protection for freedom itself. And for those of us who are concerned with preserving and extending freedom in this world, uh, our challenge is to figure out how the United States can remain the world's classroom uh, into the next century. We have three minutes, so I think we can take one question and we'll talk really fast. Go ahead. Yeah, Annie Murphy Paul, I'm a fellow here at the Yeah, thank you. My question is for um, That's one of the competencies we cover in college. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, my question is for Ms. Kazin. Um, given that the students at your institution don't have the cues and signals that come along with a traditional academic setting. How do you go about creating an alternative learning environment for them that they find uh, motivating, engaging, supportive? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Um, our mantra is technology wherever possible, humans where only humans will do. And a couple of the places where only humans will do are we have learning coaches who work with students very closely, actually quite quite um, quite intensively, and they really get to know the students. Um, and they may Skype, they may talk on the phone, they may email or text or whatever, but those coaches are assigned to students the second they're enrolled and play a really important part in motivating and encouraging and really helping students work through obstacles in a very concrete way. The other humans uh, who are particularly important are these reviewers who evaluate student work. And as I mentioned, it's a mastery model. So each time a student uh, submits work, um, they get it back with um, that rubric um, filled out and comments. So students know exactly what they need to do to get closer to mastery. Um, but another important part is there's a very strong sense of community, even though it's virtual. So um, students, and, and they're not you know, kids. I mean, these are you know, people all, all through the age spectrum um, ask each other questions, they encourage each other, and they also work on team projects because teamwork and collaboration are among the competencies that we emphasize very strongly. So um, I think it's actually in some ways um, better than, I don't know if you can say traditional online, that sounds silly, but, but you know, it's then the course in which you are in some ways sort of isolated. Um, these are, are students who are very much uh, part of a learning and um, sounds a little corny, but growing community together. And they feel it very much. We have one minute. <laughs> really quick count. question. Somebody want to sing a college fight song? <laughs> <laughs> Fantasy football is our, our sport. <laughs> The uh, conversation you had reminded me a little bit of the talk that Atul Gawande gave yesterday on healthcare, and that we shouldn't be surprised when you pay for inputs that you get expensive and little innovation. Um, so the, the uh, question is, how can we uh, leverage states to much more rapidly accelerate this progress since the, the vast bulk of the students we're talking about are actually in public institutions in states? I think it's a great question. I don't know if I have the answer in 23 seconds. I will say oh, this gives me the chance to talk about a worry. I think more states are interested in competency-based models. Um, the reasons they're interested in them, though, worry me a little bit. I think part of the reason that folks are interested is because they think we can get cheaper, faster degrees, which agreed we need cheaper, faster degrees for more types of students, but we also need to make sure that they're better or at least knowable quality. So I think that governors are certainly paying attention to this and they recognize that this is happening, but I think we all need to, to ensure that we're not just doing a race to the bottom of like fast, cheap 
but that we say, like that employers say, you know what, we actually need folks who have these particular skills and we're going to be looking and we're going to be making sure that, that it's focused on outputs. I'll try in five seconds. Uh, uh, transparent, accurate measures of quality. All right, and we are completely out of time. Great, well, thank you. Thank you.